Good evening, welcome to the Journey Home program. This is the open line first Monday episode of this uh, program in which I every week get to introduce to you converts to the Catholic Church. It's, they share their journeys, they share their struggles, sometimes the barriers that they had to get over uh, when they considered becoming Catholic. Sometimes and often they'll talk about uh, those wonderful uh, things that attracted them to the church. Um, and on this open line program, we want you to be even more part of this live presentation. So you can call us with your questions, send us an email. The guest for tonight is a returning guest. He's already been on the program. He shared his whole story. He'll share it briefly in a moment. We want to make more time for you. This guest tonight is a good friend of mine. I'll talk a little bit in a, more in a moment about Rob Rogers, former Anglican. But I want to give you the phone number so you can give us a call. It's one 800 221-9460. Outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Rob Rogers works for the Coming Home Network International. He's, he's our director of administration for our work. And we welcome you to the program. Welcome back, Rob, back. as it's I'm giving, you the, giving them the, the, the feedback. I, uh, what often happens on the journey home is sometimes when we schedule programs for a variety of reasons, some of the guests that we've scheduled or tried to schedule couldn't make it. So uh, this gave me a great opportunity to invite Rob back for a number of reasons. Besides, it's been a couple years since you've been on, right? Uh, 2005. Yeah, okay. To talk about your journey for the audience uh, and some of the reasons for becoming Catholic, but also gives us an excuse to talk about some of the conferences that the Coming Home Network puts on every year not so much to promote them, though we'd love you to, if, if you'd like to come become a part of the conferences, but to talk about why we would have a, a conference on history, or why we would have a conference as we're having in a, in a week or two on St. Paul. Is he Catholic or not? Before we get to those questions, Rob, uh, normally on the Open Line program, I invite the guests to give a quick summary. Sure. Of the, of the journey. So why don't you let the audience know Thanks, Marcus. how this Canadian ever came back to the Catholic Church. And found us a way to America. <laughs> well, I was raised in a nominal Protestant home. My family pretty much stopped going to the church when I was about 10 years of age for a variety of reasons. As an ignorant young child, I always bragged that's because I prayed not to go lo no longer go to church. I didn't want to go there. As, as a Canadian, we played road hockey nonstop. Mm -hmm. And Sunday was my day to play road hockey. And unfortunately, mom and dad wanted to go to church. And eventually, as I looked Is at it, that why then. you have the nickname Roadkill? Roadkill, that sticks in. <laughs> <laughs> Road rash. <laughs> but no, it, and and because it ended, I was happy. I got everything I wanted, as as I thought then, as a ten year old boy. And when I look at it from that day forward, I took step after step, and they got larger and larger of taking more and more of the world that was around me and just abusing it. Because hmm. as I look now in retrospect, I can see I abused his love in that moment, yeah. and took advantage and gave all that to myself. And as I opened that door, the sins just became this seemingly sweet fruit for me of attraction. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I was an individual that, that found my road down different avenues and began to like them, found my identity through drugs and alcohol, through impure relationships with women. And that's what became my life. It became who, who Rob Rogers was. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand who I was because I stopped trying to know myself at that young age mm -hmm. and tried to find myself in all these other things. And that carried on as years went on. I just got more and more in depth in it, lost more and more of myself. And it came to a point in my life that I was pretty much at a threshold. I realized that I was an alcoholic, that I, that I had a problem, that I was drinking daily, that I was using drugs daily, and I needed them. Hmm. And I did, but I didn't know how to break away. I had nowhere to go. I had no reason to change my life. I had no reason to stop impure relations with women because that's what all my friends were doing. That's what uh, something it strikes me that would be good to talk about at mm -hmm. this point in this. You, you made the comment that that's who Rob Rogers was. Right. And often that's what stands in the way of people in that position. When they come to a realization that they got to make a change, they almost have this image of themselves that they feel they need to live up to. Exactly. I I'd I'd created this persona of a person that I would go to other friends who are other universities. We'd go down from ours and go to a weekend, go visit them. And then my stories already existed there of these tales, the infamous tales that I did in those states, I always felt I had to live up to them. And you're right, I did. And unfortunately, not only did I try to live to them, I always tried to go one step further mm. to say, no, I'm not this. I am 
this. Yeah. And that's how I lost myself because I kept pushing mm. myself to become this thing that I never was. And I didn't realize that. Mm. And as the time went on and I left school for the reasons, obviously because I wasn't focusing on school, I was focusing on other issues. Through grace of my family, I got a job in a hotel in Western Canada, jumped in the car with my best, one of my best friends at the time and left. We moved to Banff and I left with this idea that I was gonna become a new person again. Not, again, not worrying about who I was at 10, mm. but how I was gonna leave what I was and become something new once more and reform myself. Unfortunately, I didn't know how. I had no basis to reform myself mm. on except the basis of this person that I was, the party rob that everyone seemed to like, who in reality, everyone found a complete irritation. Yeah. And mm -hmm. in a small mountain town, it didn't take long for that to start backfiring. And it was by God's grace that my manager at the time left for England. And my family, my mother, my grandmother was born there. So I was able to get back at Ancestry. My family was from there, so it was no problem getting my visa to go across. And I jumped on the opportunity when he contacted me. Left, jumped on a plane, shot over to England, no idea what I was doing. No idea if I was even gonna get a job. He just assumed he'd be able to give me a job. And I left with this, again, this idea, not worrying about me, worrying what other people thought, worrying about what my mother and my father thought of this son that was going back to the old country and establishing themselves in the, some of the best hotels in the UK. Unfortunately, when I got there, my old ways were hard to break and they tore me down in those hotels. Mm. They became so corrupt that I began to abuse every business, business ethic my parents had taught me to climb the ladder. To, to again make this identity of this person who's this hotelier extreme in his abilities when really it was just a farce. And I was having to keep all these images, keeping the image of me as this great worker, me as this son who my, I thought my parents thought I was, even though they knew some of the truth, not yeah. to the extent. But I was empty. I was a shell of nothing but hatred and abuse inside and just reaching out at anything I could. And on May 10th, 1998, my life changed. The night before, I left the pub as I normally would with a, with a woman. That mo next morning, that I found out she was, was a married person. And my life went in a weird way I didn't understand. Mm. I didn't brag for once. I didn't talk about it. I felt something inside. I heard my mom's voices. Because my mom, though was nominal Christian, was she held to the basic precepts of our faith, of the Christian faith. Mm. She believed in the morality of no sex before marriage. Sadly, I never understood that. Mm. And her voice I began to hear. And on May 10th, my first night that I can recall being sober, mm. I, being off the influence of drugs, lying in my bed, mm. I encountered a love that changed my life. Mm. And, I t and when that ha night happened, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if I'd lost my mind, if I'd had a a mental, emotional breakdown from all the abuses I'd done. But I encountered something. My life played before my eyes. And for the first time that I could remember, my heart wept and I wept. Mm. And I felt not as much what I was doing to me, but what I did to other people. And I think for the first time, I can remember seeing how other people saw me. Mm. And I saw this person that when I would go out at nights and do the things I did, I thought I was this great person having a blast that everyone loved, all of a sudden I heard their voices. Mm. I heard what they were really saying about me. And I realized that's who I really had become. Mm. And I just curled up in this ball, crying, not understanding what was going on. And one name came, and it was Christ. Sadly, my response was no way. There was no way. I knew who he was. I understood who Christ was but I knew who I'd become. And I thought, how are you here? How are you engaging my life? Why are you engaging my life? You're with the, the fanatics, you're not with me. I'm in the gutter of life. I take, I steal, I abuse. Why me? And it was in that moment, it was morning. And I sat in my bed, soaked from sweat and tears, moved over the edge of the bed and just sat there and something was different. I knew I couldn't have him. I knew I could not allow Christ in my life. I just couldn't. But when I looked in the mirror and I looked at my eyes, I cried because I saw that 10-year-old boy. Mm. And I started the change. I said, Chastity, 
right away. I had to stop these relationships. They ripped me apart. Alcohol I had to get rid of. Sadly, I refrained to drugs because I was a nice person on them, I thought. And I began to go into Buddhism, thinking it was this great religion that would, would help me. I began just to read whatever, every, every Eastern mysticism I get my hands on. My one uncle turned me to Kabbalism, an old form of, of Judaism that is, that is so beyond anything I could try to understand. Kabbalism, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but that's where he wanted me, the, the mystical form of Judaism. He said, go to this, go to Tao, learn all these things. He's Christian. And he steered me this way. <laughs> And I went out in them, and sadly, they were as false as I was, I found, in the end. Because once I was in them, again, I could manipulate them. I could turn them to how I wanted. I was never a good Buddhist. I still ate meat. I was still doing drugs. So all of a sudden, okay, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Taoist. I'm not a Zenist. I'm not a Kabbalist. What am I? I took them all together and made my own. Hmm. Happy Rob, getting high, doing his thing, being nice to people, meditating, doing mantras and ha chanting. And I'm a good person. And that's all. I thought that's all that mattered. And for about six, eight months, it lasted. I didn't drink. But eventually, I began to lose myself again because I had no bearing, no rudder. And I, I, but I couldn't understand that. And I began to slowly go back to old ways. And within the span of a month, my old ways were back. Mm -hmm. I left and gone to the Ritz Hotel by this time and realized my life was ending. My liver was slowing down. I was bleeding through my bowels. Mm -hmm. It was going, everything was going wrong. As it, I thought everything was going right, but I realized now I could finally see a little bit that everything was failing. And I encountered the security manager, Barry Gendron, and we would sit at lunch like this. I would hunger to be with him, as I know now the apostles on the road to Emmaus, what they talked about. Hmm. And Barry would feed me something I didn't know, hmm. but I loved it. Hmm. All I knew is I wanted it and I had to have it, and I would go and wait for him in the canteen. Barry eventually told me he was Catholic. And I sat there, and I knew I had to go back to that night. I had to go back to my no way and ask, mm. why no way? Mm. And I didn't run away from Barry. I stayed with Barry. He took me through a, a parish program for 13 weeks. I hounded him to be Catholic because I, it just, everything felt right. I found a source. I found a rudder. I found something that would tell me, this is wrong. This is right. That's what I needed. I needed guidance. It's all I cried for. I couldn't find that in denominations because, again, they were here, there, and everywhere. The Catholic Church gave me a rudder on a rock that I could not steer from. And I thrived in that environment because it was easy to say, well, I don't do this anymore. Chastity didn't make sense. Drugs don't make any sense. Alcohol makes no sense to me in an abuse. All these things made no sense to me anymore. All that made sense was Christ. And eventually, as time went on, I was confirmed in the church December 9th, 2000. A joyous day that I always said I could have walked across the Atlantic to come back home. Just on fire, waited for that reception of the Eucharist, that pinnacle of life for me to receive. I came home for my first Christmas with my family in Canada, told them I was giving up my career at the Ritz to become a missionary in America. They, <laughs> they thought I'd lost my mind, and rightly so, but they didn't realize I'd found it. I had lost everything they knew of those 27 years and found what was old. As Corinthians tells us, the old had, has gone, the new was here. I'd gone back to that child and went through the missionary work of Net Ministries, learning to evangelize. The CFRs guided me here. They put me to that. A former CFR, CFR was a former netter. He brought me to it. In the end, well, I thought I was called to the priesthood. I found my wife on the road of Net. Beautiful Bernadette. Her family is friends with you. Right. A long story short, when Net ended, came back to Ohio. Eight years later, I get to sit here, a father of four come October, and a beautiful bride of six years. So, <laughs> and even doing a little bit of evangelization work for the Coming Home Network International. Yeah, that was the view, because Net is geared to youth, yeah. and that was great. And I, I still have a, a fervor to feed the youth, because we need to. But in the Coming Home Network, you've allowed me that chance to, to counsel adults now and work, not, work with them on their journey, talk with them, mm -hmm. help them through the hurdles, because it's, it's that fellowship. That standing beside, as, as, as you so rightly, when you started the network, knew that was needed for ministers, as well as what we, we deem secondaries or laymen who are converting. Right. It's that fellowship of having someone to talk to. I had Barry. I had Edward in my yeah. catechist. I had Brother John Paul in the CFRs. And as I came here, I had Ned, and then meeting having you. There's always been someone beside me to help me and guide yeah, me. Yeah, Barry's a great example of, uh, of the ministry that you do with the Coming Home Network. I mean, being beside you and Jim 
Anderson and Mary Claire and the rest of the staff to stand beside people, not pushing, but being strongly beside. And I think that word strongly beside is, is really key when we're working with people on the journey. They need a, a strong witness of faith, but yet we still have to wait for the Holy Spirit because uh, your, your example also of the night when the Holy Spirit touched mm -hmm. your heart, you still had this huge barrier that you weren't ready at that point to hear Barry. It's no. going to take a while before the, the Holy Spirit prepared your heart. No, I, I still mocked Christians then. I wasn't ready for it. I couldn't receive it. You're right, Barry never. I hounded him. He didn't hound me. Yeah. He just, like you said, would sit as you <laughs> and I would go, here, Barry, I'm reading this book, The, the Third Chimpanzee. You know, that the man has come back and found our way back and he'd be like, what's it about? And I'd talk about it and then he would say, well, have you read this? And pass me Padre Peel. No, okay, I'll try that. <laughs> I, it, was, it, was, it was just give and take. And it was that beautiful rhetoric right they had back and forth with one another that it wanted me to keep going back, wondering what is he going to give me next? What is he going to expose me to? We have our first email that's here for tonight. And again, audience, uh, we look for your phone calls and emails tonight, really for the rest of the program. Rob and I can talk for, for a long time, but we'd love to have your questions for us. This particular question comes from Brian. He says, God bless. He says, I have, I have and still am struggling with several issues of the Christian faith. I have been looking into the Catholic, or Eastern Orthodox, Anglican faith, but it was so ingrained that I will go directly to hell for apostasy mm -hmm. if I dare even think about joining these communions. I don't want to be an enemy of God, or as I have often been told, I am a God hater. I know intellectually this is off, but emotionally, and in a spiritual sense, it is hard to get rid of this type of indoctrinization. Any help you can offer. God bless Brian. Brian, first of all, I want to say right off, we're, I'm asking the whole audience to pray for you, uh, for your awakening and the Holy Spirit to touch your life. Because all of us know how difficult it is to deal with voices, either from the, well, the world, the flesh, and the devil, right. from the world on the side, from our past, from the spiritual enemy. So what's your thoughts for Brian? It's something that you said we all face, whether we, myself, not coming from what you would gear as a, script, a scriptural background, I was of the world. So my, my things that I had to face in coming to, the, to understand Christ was the basis of just Jesus Christ, to accept His reality, because I denounced that and thought to myself, Christians were fools that believed in something they couldn't see. What was the point of it? So I had to take myself and realize that there had, I had to find the reasoning for why I needed a God. And when I realized the need for that guidance was what always kept coming back to me before, is I found the guidance and experienced Him in a, in a real sense that night and encountered Him that way, I began to know who He was through the Word. As where Brian already is, he already knows the Scriptures. Yeah. And to come where Brian is now is where I became with meeting Christ, but where do I go with Him? I needed a rock. Yeah. I needed to stand on a like at the rudder that would hold me to what is the truth. Because left on my own, I can take his word and I can pretty much stretch it to mean whatever I want it to be. I can find, I could have again found my own faith within Christianity, which thousands of people do. We know we have 33,000 different denominations in America alone because they're taking the word and self-interpreting it. Though believing the spirit is guiding them, I was doing the same. And one of the problems that ever since, uh, I mean, it's too simplistic to say this, but ever since the Reformation, when the authority of the church that Christ established has been doubted by a certain group of people, it's not as if they, you know, get rid of the idea of a church of authority and now it is just me. It isn't quite that simplistic because every single independent Christian has voices from authorities that they have read or heard from a pulpit or heard on a television program that they trust. Right. And because they trust that person, then they'll take that opinion unquestionably and it becomes the rule to influence their life. And then that gets passed on like a chain. And so Brian, I mean, there he is from some point in his life being indoctrinated to believe that he's going to hell if he becomes a Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or Anglican, he's been indoctrinated. You know, how do we break that? It's not easy. It takes the prayer of all of us around Brian. It takes Brian's own prayer. But it takes examining the sources. Mm -hmm. Where'd you get that idea from? 
you know, where's that coming from? Uh, it's, it, 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 you can't, you gotta break free from this idea that, um, that the other indoctrination that often happens for people is uh, if, if you're being drawn to Catholic Church or whatever, it's the devil. And once you get that voice in you, then it's difficult to break free because you, you start double doubting yourself and there you are. You're gonna to wanna to run. And like I said, the problem is the sources you go to when you hear these things, it's the abuse that's come from scripture. And when we step out of that and we look at history, which is the basis for yeah. where we take the mold of the, of the conferences being deep in history, deep in scripture, deep in Christ, holding on Carl Newman's motto of to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. It's when you go to the historical aspect, we look at the 2,000 years that our faith, that His Church, His Holy Catholic Church has been, we see that it was established on that rock that we find in Matthew as Peter. And we find that continuation all the way through. And that is what we see is so important with these, the historical converts we do for that reason, for people as Brian, who are so indoctrinated, they have to look through it. But you're not gonna be able to look through it just in scripture all the time because you're, like you said, you're still hearing those voices. Yeah. We need on our own to be willing to look back and see what was before, see what has been the 1500 years prior to the Reformation, see what the apostles of the apostles did. What did those that they taught, Peter, James, John, what did they do when they reached out to these other men, to St. Ignatius, St. Clement, what were they doing? What were they believing? And that's where we find the basis of his church. Yeah, yeah, I was just, th I was thinking about what you said, that the misuse of scripture, I mean, one that I'm familiar with from not so much from my background, but from a peripheral churches that were around me trying to influence me as a young man, uh, were the churches that would take a verse like, by his stripes you are healed. Mm -hmm. And they convincingly said that that verse is teaching that because of what, what Christ suffered, if you have faith, faith in him, then you will be healed. And if you're not healthy, or you're not uh, uh, growing in blessings, then you're not believing enough or you've not sacrificed enough. And so the idea that the way to receive more blessings is to give more. So of course they're looking for money. Well, once you're indoctrinated to believe that, it's hard to break away because there's that voice that says, well, but look at your life. You're sick and it's because you've left us. And pretty soon you're trapped. And just going to the Bible alone is not enough. That's why you've got to look at the sources that where those ideas come from, which is why in the end we be, become a Catholic. We've got a, a phone call, then we'll go. We okay. brought up the, the conference, but I want to make sure we get to that. But we have a call from John in Minnesota. Hello, John. What's your question for us? Hi, good evening. My question is, why did you choose the Catholic Church over the Anglican Church? What was that moment like, and, and why did you decide to choose the Catholic Church? And welcome home to you. Hey, John, thanks a lot. Great question. Thanks, John. It, when I really began to look and not just take for, for granted what I was or what my family was, what my mother was, and I looked at what had happened, I looked at the history of the Anglican Church, and I'd always heard things of Henry, Henry VIII in the past and passing, but when I really began to look at that and I saw the break and the reasoning for his break, the selfishness of his break, to no longer listen to the Pope because of marriage, I saw myself and my decisions in Henry, and I could relate to him. I could not be a part of a church that was how I was in trying to find my identity. Henry was more important about what was Henry, not what was Christ. When I came, when I came to Christ on that night of May 10th and then pushed him away and eventually found my way back, I no longer wanted what does Rob want. I wanted what does God want for Rob. And when I found that was through Barry in his Catholic church, his Catholic church was Christ looking out for me. The church was there based on following Christ, on the whole promise of the Holy Spirit. The church wasn't acting in its own regard as Henry was. The church, the Catholic, his Catholic church acts in regard for all of us to make us holy, to draw us to Christ, to make us the saints. Henry wanted what Henry wanted. Uh, this, the day we scheduled this program is an interesting feast day. Talk to the audience a little bit about our feast day today. We have the Feast of the Martyrs. First Martyrs of the Reformation, St. John Houghton, I believe is today, and, and St. John Ramos, a, a Jesuit, who I got the celebrate Father Mitch in Mass today, which was fantastic. But it, that's the basis. The, Henry was so arrogant in what he believed that he knew Christianity to be, and that Rome was so wrong, that he began to kill, that he began to outlaw the priests, he began to seek them down and hunt them and persecute them, not against Christ, but treasonous against him.
So again, it was focused to the man. Henry didn't seem to focus to God. The Anglican Church, to me though, retained the liturgical aspects, wasn't focused in its, in its beginning on Christ. It was on the choice of one man. That, in essence, you're, you're answering John that becoming deep in history. Again. Was really that. We, a couple years ago, we, uh, anyways, after the Journey Home programs and our work with converts, we began recognizing more and more on how history played such an important role in so many of our journeys. And so we started these conferences called Deep in History Conferences. They're in October every year. Uh, you'll know more, more about them as we get close to it because uh, we'll advertise them on the program. But talk a bit, just before we take a break, talk a little bit about why. What is the power of history? Why is that so important? We find what I found, I can't say what we found, what I found and what I, when speaking with others and, and listening to you and, and everyone else through the network and our fellow friends, is we find what is real. I had a hard time. The Word of God is an error. It is the Word of God given to us. But I still wanted the personal. I wanted to know the people. Mm -hmm. History allowed me to meet the men through their lives, through their choices, through what they were taught. And through history, history historically, I saw it going all the way back, and I could follow it all the way back, finding the truth that is taught to us today in its beginnings, being taught in the time of the apostles, mm -hmm. in, the, in the first centuries after. And I see that, that the history is what brings us all, unites us all. If we only look from 1500 forward, we're left to find out where we want to be. Again, the whole idea of where am I with Christ? I want to be mm -hmm. where Christ is for me. One of the things we've done in the Deep in History conferences, we, we did it purposefully and, and to recognize that when you become deep in history, uh, Newman, it came from Newman's statement, which he made in the, the introductory chapter of his book on the essay on the development of doctrine, which is a, a book that has had a big influence on so many of the guests on the Journey Home program. Uh, <clears throat> but he makes the comment to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. And the idea of becoming deep in history, uh, we can say, okay, I want to become deep in history, so I'm going to read more about the Civil War, or I'm going to read more about the Revolution. So you go back farther, you know, so I'm going to read the, all the way there to the Reformation. But what we found is that, as you just heard so often in the Journey on program, if you watch it a lot, it's going all the way back, okay, let's look at not just Acts, and then jump 1,500 years to the Reformation, which is the way, I, basically, I learned some history and seminary, and to some extent, everything else in between was nothing but missionaries going forth on their own, in a way. But the idea that, okay, there were men and women who learned the faith from the apostles. Did they write anything? Mm -hmm. while wow, they did. They're called the apostolic fathers. What about those that learned it from them? Those are the early church fathers. And you follow this through. And we've done that with our history conferences. The first was kind of history in general. Then we went to the early church fathers, mm -hmm. and then we went to the Reformation, and we kind of followed it all the way through. Um, and then this year we're going to do something unique for us, and that is instead of looking at a period of history, as we're looking at the authority of the church and how has it been understood from the beginning all the way through. That's, think about how important that is about understanding how did the authority of our faith, um, how was it understood in the Old Testament? First years of the church, early church fathers, the Middle Ages, and all the way through. How did people determine what was true? I mean, that was your own journey. Right. Determining how am I going to change my life? Where's my rudder? Where's the source of truth? And it's nowhere else. And that's what we have, what we're looking at. Instead of doing periods now, it's the history of the doctrine. And it's the one that is the root of, of all questioning mine in my own way of, of not coming to Scripture, and the same as most pastors, is where's the authority lie? Who has the authority? If it is not me reading the Bible, then where is the authority? And we can only find that by looking into the historical sense of the fathers and their writings. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we've got a couple emails and phone calls. We'll see you in just a bit.
welcome back to The Journey Home. Uh, this is Open Line First Monday, and uh, I have with us tonight one of my best friends, Rob Rogers, works with me at the Coming Home Network International. And um, let's see, we were lining up some phone calls, emails maybe before we go. I think we're still waiting a little bit. Um, we mentioned a little bit about the Deep in History conferences right. that we do. And these are all uh, directly related to the Journey Home program because in many ways our experience of hearing the, the conversion stories week after week after week for now 12 years has helped us see why a conference on history is really significant. Uh, and we've got in just another week, right, week and a half. Week and a half. We've got a conference on, uh, was, essentially it's called, was Paul Catholic? Right. The Catholic Paul. The Catholic Paul. And you can find out about that at chnetwork.org, our website. Um, but why would we do, talk about the significance of doing a conference on that topic. Why is that even a question? Again, it, it kind of took that, on our emblem we have deep in history, deep in scripture, deep in Christ. And we always saw the historical aspect of the church. Deep in Christ, we kind of took a different angle of, of smaller events, one day events. Yeah. We still wanted to hold, like I said, to that historical questioning of, of different aspects of our faith. And one of the one of the big ones that come up that we all face is the epistles of Paul. Because looking at just those verses, taking them out of context, we can run with a whole bunch of things. We can find Paul looking to see if he's teaching predestination, yeah. that he's con condemning the clerics, that this isn't where we're supposed to be going. So when it's not looked at and viewed properly, and you yourself have said it, it helped your Calvinist mindset mm -hmm. that Paul wasn't a Catholic. Well, then what are we left with? So this question, we can't take full credit for the Catholic Paul Conference. Dr. Scott Dr. Hahn Scott. Yeah, was... contacted us and laid it out, and we thought about it, you thought about it, asked me, and we ran with it. And on May 16th, six of you guys are going to get together and discuss was Paul Catholic and lay out the historical truth, the truth of who he is, the truth in the scriptures and understand Paul in light of who he is through the word of God and in, in, in context, not just taking one verse and subtracting it out, but the whole that is there of all his epistles and looking at Paul and showing that Paul was without a doubt yeah. in line pushing forward what we have today that Christ established in his Catholic Church. In you Catholic viewers know that this last year has been the year of St. Paul. And my guess is that there are many non-Catholics when they heard that wondered what, what are Catholics doing a conference or a year on St. Paul because they presume that Paul is the foundation for their Calvinist or even Luther's theology. Yeah. Um, and the, the truth is, which is what this program has been about for 10 years, you listen to the guests, you realize, no, really it's through the teachings of St. Paul that so many of us are Catholic. The, all the verses, really the main verses that opened my heart to the Catholic Church were the verses of St. Paul. 1 Timothy 3.15, hmm. pillar and foundation of truth of the church. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, where it says that we hold on to the tradition that we had from the beginning, both oral and written. I mean, all these verses from St. Paul had such a strong influence. And we see that he was defending the authority of the church. Ephesians is all about the church, the importance of baptism. Those of you that aren't Catholic, I strongly challenge you to look through new eyes at the letters of St. Paul and see his foundation for our Catholic faith. I think we have a caller. Hello. This is uh, Christopher from North Carolina. Hello. What's your question for us tonight? Yes. Um I converted to the church three years ago at 16 uh, by myself. Welcome no, home. Thank you. <laughs> no one no one in my family or none of my friends were Catholic at the time. So I had the church family there to support me in, in making it through that and giving me the motivation that I had to, to make it through that. Yeah. And since then, I joined the uh, the, arms, arm, the Marine Corps, yeah. and I moved away. And well, since I, haven't, I don't have that support anymore. And my question is, how do you continue on the on the straight road and not going back to the, the alcohol and the, the impure lifestyle while you don't have the support that you used to? Because, you know, very busy with going to Iraq and coming back and getting ready to go again and all those things. Oh, man. How do you keep up? How do you keep up the faith while losing the support that you had at the beginning to convert? Well, Christopher, let me also say that we're proud of you for your commitment. Without a doubt. And uh, our prayers are with you. Your family is, is the, the, your local family that you talked about of support is one thing, but you have, right now, every EWTN viewer is praying for you. Think about that when you're over there. We're all praying for you and proud of you for your willingness 
to put your life on the line for our freedoms. So we, we pray for you in that. And I mean, my first thought would have been that, that he would have had a chaplain, but that's not always the case, right? Right, they're hard to find sometimes. And it's hard to find men in the military because of the lifestyle it is. They are there, but we have to be willing to seek them out. One thing, Christopher, feel free to get my email through the Coming Home Network and I would be more than willing to remain. It, it's through email, so it wouldn't be as the physical fellowship that you're desiring, but I, I'll, I know what you're going through. When I left England and came back to Canada before coming to America, I had nothing. I had no friends. I had no fellowship. You had Catholic support in, in London in, that in you London, had developed. The CFRs were right. instrumental in my life surrounding me, gave me everything that I needed. And, and, and from them, all my fellowships stem. But when I left and went, to, went home to Canada, all I had was my past. There was no one. I'd never been a Catholic or a Christian in my hometown. I had no one, and it was, you're right, it was easy to fall back to old ways. I fell back to times of, of occasional drinking. Thanks be to God, I held to my, my more reason for chastity because I knew I had to. I think more because physically I'd lost so much, and I, I had jaundice, I had cirrhosis in my liver, all these things are going on that I don't think any woman in the right mind would want to be near me. <laughs> Thanks be to God, I was glad for that in all honesty. But I had no one. But what I did is I began to pray. Brother John Paul, I called him once a week in England, and I, I told him, why am I here? I can't see why God wants me. Over there I had all of you guys. Now I have no one, as, as you're finding. And he said, well, let's pray. And as Marcus eloquently said, EWN viewers are going to be praying for you from this day forward. But Brother John Paul and I prayed that night together on the phone. The next day at Mass that I would go to every day at noon, I'd walk in there. No one would acknowledge me. It was the same people every day. The little old lady that led the Angelus turned and nodded her head and smiled at me. And I wept because I, someone knew I was there. And I was receptive of just that little bit. But as God gives, and he, he wells that graces into our lives when we accept that little, that little bit from him. As I left Mass, this girl came running up to me. Andrea became my first Catholic friend, introduced me to her friends, and I had fellowship. And through them, I found my strength. But we have to be ready as Christ walked in the desert. As the Israelites, the Hebrews had to walk in those times in the nomadic lands of no one. We have those times to strengthen us, but we have to remain true to our convictions, true to what we found, and remind ourselves every day who we are in God's eyes and who we desire to be for ourselves. And remember that as Paul said in Corinthians, that you are a new creation, that you have changed. The old is gone, the new is here, but only if you believe. That's, that verse can be so flippant and thrown out into people's lives from what you and I struggle from, the change from. But if we truly believe and we truly accept Christ, that verse should remind us every single morning that we are no longer what we were. We are something new, and we have to stand up and live that life. I'm going to segue from that to this email because it touches a little bit on what you're just talking about, Rob. This comes from Laura in Chicago. Dear Marcus and Rob, can Rob speak to how he handled his past sins and how he reconciled them in his first confession? Also, what else can Rob say about the confession that might help others begin to understand why it is so important in our lives? She writes, only through the grace of God. Amen. Laura in Chicago. Thank you, Laura. Yes, thank you, Lord. The, one funny story before I get into the, before I was truly catechizing confession, I was going. I'd just go and sit. And I had an old Irish priest with the strongest brogue to talk through. And every time it would come to the act of contrition, I didn't know what it was. I thought he said the act of contribution. I would leave the confessional and empty my pockets in the poor boxes that still exist in England, only later to find out what the act of contrition was. That's always my humorous story of the confessional. But my first confession that was given and understanding what it was, it was only in England. The only way it could be done was over afternoon tea, sitting in the parlor of the rectory for four hours talking with, with Father Robert Plurd and just getting it all out. And it was the first time in my life that I was honest mm -hmm. about my struggles with addictions, with, with habitual acts to drugs, to alcohol, to women. It was that fact of letting it out. And one of the best things that Father said to me, advice that I hold for everyone who has those struggles, is keep it in the light. From that day forward, I did not hide the fact mm -hmm. of what my choices led me to in the past. I, did, I wasn't shy, I was not nervous of letting people know that I had problems with alcohol, that I was an abuser of drugs, that I was an abuser of women. I was open. I lived an open book, okay. as the letters of John tell us. Keep it in the light, were the words of Father Plurin, and they stick with me to this day. And it's those, that basis, that simple rule helped me. Mm -hmm. Because when people who get in those habitual choices, we lie. 
We I'm try to cover up. Particularly those in alcohol or drug right. issues. You, you get accustomed to living a lie that you think other people believe. Oh, without a doubt. And you're so accustomed to that, though, even after the conversion, it's hard to break free from that. I mean, that's Horses wear blinders. Those of us who are like that have the blinders in front of our eyes because yeah. we can't see how you're looking at us. Yeah. Everyone knew what I was doing. I was the only one that thought no one knew. Hmm. And so we have to keep it in the light. That is just, it is the basis of all the things that I live for now in my choices, that any time that the question comes up, no matter where I am, I worry not of what will come to me. As we see with the apostles, with Paul, with Peter, with all of them before the council, they said they were always ready to witness. And in my life, my past is what is the, the thorn in my side, as Paul would speak, is what holds. But what we have to do is Paul spoke of his thorn. We have to speak of our thorns if we struggle with those things. All right. We've got a caller from Kentucky. This is Jesse. Hello. What's your question tonight? Hi, uh, Marcus. I love your show. Thanks, Jesse. And my question for Rob is, uh, uh, as someone who does evangelization and as someone who comes from a nominally Christian home, I'd like to know what he thinks is the best way to reach out to the unchurched. Because usually evangelicals will just say, let me teach you the sinner's prayer, give you a Bible, there you go. But we have more to work with, so what's the best way to start? <laughs> All right, Jesse, thanks a lot. Great question. The best way is through the way we live our lives. I'm reading the book now, The, the Soul of the Apostolate. Mm. And it takes us as Christians, as Catholics, to understand the need, the necessity of an interior life. We have to have a life of prayer before we can take God to other people. And it is through that influence of truly developing a life of prayer that we can go and we can meet other people and they begin to question why. When I go home, those of my old life, most of them still don't see the change. They still think that one day it's gonna go back. They don't understand. But what's key is they ask why. They begin to ask why. And as soon as you begin to ask why, as I asked that night on May 10th, I asked why, you crack it open. Once you get a little bit of room and you make someone who doesn't believe in God, ask, go, they leave you and they ask themselves, why does why does Rob believe in God? They've opened a door that they're not going to be able to shut because God will pour into their lives and begin to have, you just have to be ready to give answer at that moment. We have to pray, and when the time comes, as Peter says, be ready to offer and defend to witness. Not defend, but to, to witness, to tell them what is there. Because there's a time in their life when I was close, like you said, that I wouldn't have wanted to hear from Barry. But we need to be ready when those prayers are answered. Whoever, God willing, get to heaven, I'll know who was praying for me whoever opened my heart to be ready for Barry. We have to be ready to be as Barry was, as I seek to be, for when someone else is ready to ask. We just have to be there in prayer mm -hmm. and witness. Yeah, a friendship mm -hmm. is uh, building that channel of friendship so that y you, you kind of earn the right to be heard, a, trust, a trusting relationship, and you're always nurturing that friendship with prayer so that you've got grace working, you got the uh, guardian angels working. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And an unchurched person is interesting because uh, it depends you know, once you get to know them because sometimes an unchurched person does not come to the encounter with a lot of anti-Christian baggage. Sometimes that's not there. Right. They haven't had been in a church and then rejected it and had all that baggage. That They're coming with a lot of ignorance. They just don't know. So sometimes after you've developed a relationship and you pray, Sometimes giving them a gospel of John, you never know. The Holy Spirit can use that. They, they don't believe it's an inspired book yet, right? They don't see it with any authority. It's a story they've never read. And, and by, I mean, to some, to some extent, I almost yearn for that innocence uh, where you're just reading it. Uh, and for the first time, you're hearing the story of Jesus. And... Uh, the Word was God, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The and word. that's how I came wow. to know it. But it wasn't any Christian, as you said. Right. In some sense, there was. It was what I developed as my yeah. own any Christian. But nothing any Catholic. Yeah. Didn't understand why people hate Catholics or be this or that. But what it boils down to is the morality and ethical choices. Yeah. That's what I had to fight. And that's what John will face when, when we're doing what he said, the unchurched, the unbelieving, is they have their own basis of moral and ethical mm -hmm. reasoning. We're going to challenge that and say, no, this is wrong. Well, why? and they need to see it in your life. An email from Martha from New Mexico. Dear Marcus and Rob, you mentioned the CFRs earlier. Can you explain who they are? With great pleasure, the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. A lot of us will know Father Benedict Rochelle, 
as one face. Father Apostoli, Andrew Apostoli, is another that is, that is very prolific on EWTN. They're the Gray Friars. They are, to me, they were God's vehicle that helped me understand and answer the questions. After my night of that intense love with Jesus Christ, I didn't know where to go with it. I didn't know how to use it. They showed me who that love was, and they did it first in a witness of how they live. They are such a strong witness. When they go in, they're based a lot through the Bronx and Yonkers, but they're all over the world now. When they go, they seek out the poorest, the most dilapidated parts. They were in Canning Town in London, mm -hmm. that at the time, that was the, the brothers I met there, was one of the poorest boroughs in all of London. Mm -hmm. They were in the middle of the housing projects, walking around in their gray habits, meeting the people who lived the life that I was living. Mm -hmm yet they meet you with love. They just have, I can't say enough for them and who they are, but they're on, I believe it's thegrayfriars.com mm. is how you can find them online. But if you were to type in CFRs and Father Grishel, you'll find them on there. And they have such a witness, a powerful witness to give to the poor that they go out and reach out to those, the unchurched a lot of times. And they witness that interior life of solid prayer. And conviction. And I, I can't imagine that anyone who's watching this program hasn't watched Father Grishel right. on this network. But if it's a chance you have it, Sunday night, Father Grishel's live program, I strongly encourage you to tune in and hear uh, our wonderful brother in faith, father in faith, Father Grishel is just a tremendous gift from God for us. Um, let's take this next call from uh, Betty from North Carolina. Hello, Betty, what's your question? Uh, yes, as newly converted Catholics, I wanted to know Welcome what home. your feelings were about those cradle Catholics who leave the church for the new mega churches yeah. or the Bible only churches, and what might your reaction be to extended family members who have done this? All right, thanks, Betty. And welcome home yourself. We, we appreciate that. But, I mean, that's. A continuing problem, of course. It is, and it boils down to they didn't know what they were leaving. No one would walk away from Christ. It, and we look back in John 6, when, he, when Jesus gives the discourse of the bread of life, and when he says, you must eat my body, we see in John chapter 6, in verse 66, how many droves walked away from him, yeah. whining, how can I eat your body? How can I eat your flesh? How can we do this? He turned to those closest and put the question to them. And it was Peter that responded back, to whom shall I go? They understood. Those that walked away understood Christ in their own way as cradle Catholics who walk away. But we have to be willing to reach out to them. There's so many ministries. The Coming Home Network focuses, focuses more to the non-Catholics, but we deal with reverting Catholics. But there are so many ministries that their sole mission of their apostolate is to focus on educating Catholics who have fallen away from the faith. It is, I think, one of the largest denominations, if you want to put it in that way, of mm -hmm. fallen away Catholics of their own group. Yeah. And we have to be willing to reach out to them, not to be afraid of them, to realize that they have questions that need to be answered. And a lot of times, as most exes are, they have the most anti-Catholic attitude about them because I've always looked at it in the sense that they've walked away from something they don't know. Now they're trying to root themselves in something else, so they attack what they were. And you have to meet them with love and just bring yeah. them back. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder whether behind the question was a question about, well, what about their salvation mm. if they've left the church? Because uh, if you take the, the strict teaching of, of the teaching of the church, if a person's Catholic and leaves the church, then they're in schism. Well, the number one, my comment to that is number one, it's not our prerogative to stand in judgment of anyone. Jesus says right. that. It's not our job. Um, and we, we shouldn't do that, all right? Do we say that therefore it doesn't matter? No, I'm not saying that. It's certainly the teaching of the church says that if you have, as it says in Hebrews chapter 6, once you've tasted of the beauties of the church, you're, you're a, a, of the spirit. In other words, you've been baptized. You're part of the church and you reject that. Hebrews 6, 4 talks about all that you reject that, then you're rejecting Christ. Mm. You're rejecting the church, you're rejecting Christ. So it's not for us to, to stand in judgment of a person, but our warning is to those that would consider doing that or in that situation, that it's not between you and us, it's between you and Jesus. And so our job, thirdly then, we don't stand in judgment, but we are to tell 
the fullness of the church. That's why the journey on program actually after all these years is to not stand in judgment of anyone who's outside the church, but to proclaim the fullness, to point out some of the false roads, but the fullness of the church. Right. And you know, Rob, you're from Canada and you, there's a whole big section of Canada that one time was one of the strongest Catholic sections of the world. Right, we look what's happened with Quebec. There's there's beauty in the revival now we're seeing yeah. under Cardinal Mark Goulet and he's really... Great Cardinal. Oh, without a doubt, diving in. And, but he's focusing on the youth as well. Yeah. He's realizing we must wake them up. And a lot of times we're finding it's the youth in Quebec who is waking up the parents yeah. and reminding them, Mom, Dad, this is, you confer us confirmed. You took me to First Communion. You've let this go. You've forgotten of the beauty yeah. that, that John Paul would call the pinnacle of our faith, yeah. the source and summit. Yeah, yeah. We can, to me, Quebec and other places like that are the danger of our faith. We can't presume yeah. that because somebody's born baptized that they just catch it or that we make sure they do all the rituals that they're going to catch that this is about Jesus. We've got to make sure they know. It becomes too easy to go through the motions, yeah. as we hear over and over again. Yeah. Though I was raised in Catholic schools. I was, went to Mass at all the sacraments, but I never got it. And that's what they walked away. Yeah. But it's because, like you said, it was never given to them. No one ever reached out and said, what do you want to learn? They just sat. And we can't be passive with our faith. Our faith has to be active. And we have to be willing to reach out and to teach. Here's an email from Ellie from Wisconsin. Hi, Marcus. What do you say to people who say that the true church is all people who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior? There should not be any denominations, including Catholic. What are we left with? <laughs> We're left where I started. I would have become a Christian and believe what I wanted out of the Word. If the Word is true, if Christ is true, which He is, and which the Word is, there is one source of truth. There is not truths. We cannot diversify and put indifference into what is the one true faith. He is one God, one Lord, one faith, one church. To leave anything, at, put anything more into that, we're creating our own aspects that we want. We're saying, God, I want this in Christianity. Well, I want this. That's not what's important. What's important is what He gives to us, what He has given to us. And we have to accept this, not for us to change, to believe a bunch of all the believers, the body of believers are it. It is, as Scripture tells us, yeah. it is divided amongst you know, itself. I can relate to that question because there was a time in my evangelical years when I could at least have said that that was the one important thing, thread. Didn't matter which church you belonged to or all the different doctrines, that the real thread was, do you know Jesus and have you, is, have you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior? But what I was blind to is the absurdity of the idea that that really is the only thread because in that statement, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Behind that statement is a whole bunch of theology. Who is Jesus? Okay, what does it mean that he's Lord? What do we mean that he's our Savior? How is he our Savior? What does that require of us? How does it change us? How do we know what we shouldn't do or not do? How does it, how, what do we believe about Jesus? that he's one of the Trinity, that he's divine, a good teacher. So the idea that's all you need, there's a lot either presumed or rejected behind it. And we're going to jump into old heresies yep. over and over again. The Arians still believed in Christ, but the divinity was always challenged. So how are we going to see him? Like I said, who is Jesus is the ultimate question. And if we're left on our own, we're going to make him whoever we want him to be. I'll give you a chance, Rob. Give the audience, we've got like a minute to go, give them one little quick pitch on the St. Paul Conference that's coming up or... When's it going to be? A week and a half, May 16th, Columbus, Ohio. One day, Marcus Grodi, Father Pacwa, Scott, Dr. Scott Hahn, Jeff Cavins, Dr. Mary Healy, and Dr. Jeff Morrow. It's going to be an amazing day that we look at who Catholic Paul is, at who St. Paul was, who was this man who was the persecutor, whose name put fear into Christians, made them flee, who became Christian himself, encountered Christ, and established and built the faith amongst the Gentiles. All right. Who is he? If you'd like to find out more about that, you go to the website. It'll be on the on the screen, chnetwork.org. Uh, Rob, thanks a lot. Um, it's my pleasure. Uh, real quickly, um, uh, let's just thank those that are on the journey that have called tonight. 
-hmm. thank the Lord for their lives, right? We ask prayer, especially those who called like that soldier who are seeking faith and any of you that are really trying to find the church, we pray that the Holy Spirit would open your heart and mind to see this wonderful fullness that we've been able to experience by like only the gift of grace. Thank Amen. you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. See you again next week. Thank you.